this morning. Mm -hmm. And that we have a great, great God. Take your Bibles or your phone or device and turn to Ephesians, if you would, in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter number 6. And uh, to recall to your memory, or if you're new today, uh, we've been in a series called Conversations with God. And uh, we've been looking at prayer over the last seven weeks, and uh, our six weeks, and today is our seventh uh, and in our series, uh, Conversations with God. And we've entitled, entitled it today, Prayer and the Spiritual Battle and Beyond. Uh, prayer and the Spiritual Battle and Beyond. If you want to take some notes, there's an outline on the back of your bulletin you can fill in or take some notes on uh, this morning. Ephesians chapter uh, number six, and uh, while you're while you're doing that, I want to I want to talk to you just if you would once you find your place. Look at you just for a second. Um, many of you know, since our church family, uh, we're going to our our annual meeting on the 28th, and uh, we've got some ideas, some big ideas we'd like to do to help reach people in our community, help our church be more welcoming and inviting. Things that we want to do just to upgrade. Uh, you see, we're having problems with our our. our Projectors, and uh, we want to better uh, update our online presence. A lot of things we want to do to help just press out the gospel to people. And uh, it came to my mind this week, and I don't know if it came to yours, um, but you know, um, the, there's a gift that keeps on giving. Did you know that? It's called the federal government. The federal government is the gift that keeps on giving. And uh, we're, in, we're in tax season. Some of you are getting returns. Some of you are going to be getting a big fat tax check in the mail. And uh, and here I want you to pray about doing. I want you to pray about what would God have me to give towards getting the gospel out out of this gift that I'm getting from the gifter that keeps on giving again. And, uh, and uh, listen, we're not doing it to have our savings account. We're not doing it to, to bank money. We're not begging for money. But here's what we want to do. We want to press out the gospel. Uh, we want to we want to be able to push Jesus out in our community and help people know who Jesus is. And here's an opportunity for you to say, Lord, what can I do to be a part of that financially? And uh, you're getting a gift, and and uh, it's going to come to your check account or through the mail, and and just say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Uh, what what can I do with that that help benefits the kingdom of God and not just benefit my kingdom here on earth? Amen. And uh, so pray about that if you would, and consider what that may be, and, and I know the Lord will uh, bless you. We'll talk more about that next week uh, as well. Ephesians chapter 6 this morning, and uh, as we've been going through this conversations on prayer, and uh, conversations with God about prayer, uh, I wanted to end it uh, this week, and let me, let me back up, I, 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 I do a lot of studying on Tuesdays, and then I, I let it simmer on Wednesdays. Now, if you know what simmer means, it's like a good pot of beans on the stove. You get them started. Once you get them soaked, you get them in, and you get them started in the slow cooker, and then you just let them sit a while. And so I get really cranked up on Tuesdays, and then I let it simmer on Wednesdays, and I come back to it on Thursday. And then Thursday, as I was working on the message, I realized that it was way too much information to cover just today. So I had to break it up into this Sunday and next Sunday. And, uh, and so uh, be prepared to come back and get some more uh, of this message next Sunday. But as I was winding this down and coming to the end, uh, I realized we need to address one more particular need in prayer. And, uh, and that is prayer and spiritual warfare. Because the Apostle Paul, uh, probably the greatest Christian to ever live outside of Jesus, wrote this particular church in Ephesus. And he addressed at the end of his letter, and how he addressed spiritual warfare is that he connected our praying to this battle, to this spiritual battle that's going on. I wonder this morning, have you ever considered why praying is so challenging? You ever thought about that? Why is praying so challenging? Why is it such a struggle in our lives, and, and why, why is it so hard for me to continually be consistent at it? Or why is it just exhausting? Praying can be exhausting. Uh, have you ever fell asleep while praying? <clears throat> Absolutely. <laughs> so what, what's, what's, what's that all about, and what's going on with all of that? I like what Tony Evans said. Uh, Pastor Tony Evans said this when he was talking about why prayer is such challenging. And he said this, because life is not a playground, life is a battleground. And I thought that was very telling. Life is not a playground, life is a battleground. And you and I need to recognize that as we go through our lives, 
Yes, there's a lot of playing going on, and yes, there's a lot of activity going on, but in our world and in our lives and in the, the, the spiritual realm, there is a battle going on. Look, if you would, at verse 10 of Ephesians 6, and I'm going to read through verse 18, or actually through verse 20 this morning, and then come back and, and begin to unravel for us how prayer is connected to the spiritual battle. He says in verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may, that he may be able to stand against the schemes of of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take on the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray for more. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Lord, your word is truth. It is the power of God and the salvation. Lord, your word, your word is what we need today. Lord, I've got a lot of words written on a paper, but there's no more value to them than yours. So Lord, make it real. Make it alive in each of us as it is in your Bible. God, may we leave here today with something that's from you that's going to be a help and an encouragement in our praying in the spiritual battle going on around us. And we'll thank you, Lord. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Prayer uh, is engaging in a spiritual <coughs> warfare. Uh, it's a spiritual warfare that is not of this world, of this visible world, but in a spiritual world with an enemy that we cannot see and with an enemy that we do not really understand. Uh, hold your place there in Ephesians if you would and turn if you can find it in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. In the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 and verse number 10. We are engaged in it with an enemy that we cannot see and typically we do not understand here Daniel, a prophet of God, and uh, he is engaged uh, in, a, in a foreign area. He's been captured uh, from his hometown, and he's been made a servant in a foreign land with a foreign kings, and, but he maintained his love for God, and he maintained praying, the Bible says, three times a day. And Daniel here in Daniel 10 is praying. But notice, if you would, in verse number 10, and behold, he says... Uh, a hand touched me and sent me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, Old Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. And yet the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the king of Persia. Daniel is describing a 
event that happened where he began to pray and seek the Lord. And God heard his prayer and God was responding with an answer. But he says the king of Persia, which represents the enemy, represents Satan, withstood that answer. He was holding that answer back. For 21 days, the answer was withheld in the heavenlies, in the spiritual world, from getting to Daniel. If you go to Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, we find Jesus has just been baptized. He's started his public ministry, and, and in Luke chapter 4, we find the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God, the, the Holy Spirit, in verse number 1, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by who? The by the devil. We see that this enemy appears to Jesus and he's doing battle with Jesus. He's, he's tempting Jesus. And, and we know that this was not the only time this happened because look down at verse 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. We see that Daniel was engaged in this spiritual battle and Jesus was engaged in in this spiritual battle. Not just once, but many times did the enemy come. And now in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells us that we are in the middle of this battle and that we, in verse 18, need to be praying at all times. And not only praying at all times, but three times he tells us to stand, to stand, to stand. I don't know about you this morning. But I know for me, I want to grow in prayer. How about you? Mm -hmm. I want to grow in prayer. I, I, I want my prayer life to be consistent. I, I want to see prayer in my life become more relational with God and not just religious. More relational with God and not just robotic. Uh, I want my prayer life to be something that not only brings our, uh, glory and honor to God, but it changes me. And I hope that's what you want for yourself as well. And if we're going to do that, then we have to be consistent in praying. Praying at all times. Paul is coming to the end of this letter in chapter 6. And he has taught them in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Paul has taught them what the gospel has done for them. What Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, we're about to celebrate Easter, when, when Jesus came to the earth fully God and fully man. And he came and lived the perfect life that you and I could not live. And he died the death that you and I deserved. And he died in our place. And, he, and when he died on the cross, he, he took our sins and he paid for our sins. And the Bible says he became sin for us who knew no sin that we could be the righteousness of God. And because of what Jesus did on the cross and dying for my sins and giving me forgiveness and giving me eternal life. In chapters 1 through 3, he tells us what the gospel does for us. Then in chapters 4 through 6, Paul teaches them what living looks like through the power of the gospel in our new family of Jesus. And he's coming to the end of these three chapters on what it looks like to live in the new family of Jesus. And in verse 10, he uses this word, finally. Finally. Now, he's not using this word to say this is the end. He's not using this word to say this is the last thing I have to say to you. He's using this in a way of, can I have your attention, please? So can I ask you, church, can I have your attention? Because there is something that is really vital that you need to hear. There is something I need to tell you that you need to pay attention to. And so he says, finally. And you may be asking, Pastor, finally what? Well, finally, here's what I want you to pay attention to. My, my sermon, if I had to put it in a sentence today, would be this. If we're going to be successful at praying and in spiritual warfare, then we need to engage in strategic praying. We need to engage in strategic praying. So my prayer this morning is you let, you let me, through God 
God's Spirit to help you engage in that kind of praying this morning. So, Pastor, how do we do that? Number one, praying is a strategic element in our engagement of spiritual warfare. Praying is a strategic element in our engagement in spiritual warfare. Would you look back at verse 18 with me? He says in the very beginning of verse 18, praying at all times. Would you say that with me out loud? Praying at all times. Paul says praying, he's telling them, praying, praying at all times. What is he saying? He is saying that you and I are to be participating in prayer. That you and I are to be participatory. We're not just to come to church and hear someone else pray. Uh, we're not to, to come in and just listen to others pray. But we are to be engaged. We are to be participating in prayer. Prayer should be for you and should be for me a way of life. So how, how do you know that? Well, the Bible says in Romans 12 and verse 12, we are to be constant in prayer. In Colossians 4, verse 2, we are to continue steadfastly in prayer. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. 2 Timothy 1, verse 3, Paul said that he prayed night and day. So I think it's pretty clear that we are to be participating in prayer. Would you agree? Amen. Yes. We're to be practicing prayer. We're to be engaged in in praying. Now, now look back with me, if you would, at the Bible in verse 16. He says, now, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. He, he begins to start a new sentence after verse 15. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. He's continuing on. It's not a, it's not a completed thought. And take up the helmet of salvation... And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And what is after the Word of God? There is that. A, is there? Did you see a punctuation there? What is that? It's a comma. He's continuing the list off. So not only do we do we take up the shield of faith. Not only do we put on the helmet of salvation. Not only do we take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But also we are to be praying at all times. See. Praying is continuous in this list of things that we are to be doing. See, praying is not just an, an afterthought or supplemental to the armor of God, but it is a strategic element, a part of engagement in this battle. You need prayer. I need prayer in my life. Right. Now, you may be saying, Pastor, what are we engaged in? You talk about this engagement, you talk about this battle, you talk about this warfare. What are, what are we engaged in? We are engaged in a spiritual warfare. Something we cannot see and many times do not understand. Go back, if you would, to chapter 6 and verse 11. <clears throat> he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. <clears throat> Excuse me. For we, verse 12, do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's spiritual warfare. It is a spiritual battle, but it has great implications on this earth and on you and on me. Paul did not call us in these verses to engage or to enter the warfare. I remember I had a, a, a professor in Bible college, and uh, I remember him telling us, he says, there's, but number two, he said this. He says, I never run looking for a fight with Satan. Paul does not tell us to engage in the warfare. He is advising you, you are already in it. It is already present. It is already real. It is already happening. It is already taking place. You don't have to go look for it. It is there. He is making us aware. He tells us that not only are we in it, but he also says simply, look at verse 
uh, 10, that we are to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, and that we are to stand, verse 11, against the schemes of the devil. And in verse 12, he tells us to stand firm. Verse 13, he tells us to stand firm. He says we're not to engage it, we're not to run after it, we're not to seek for it, but it's a time that though we are in it, we are to be strong in the strength of God, and we are to take our stand. We are not to give up, we are not to quit, we're not to give a square inch of ground, we're not to run away from it, we are to stand against the enemy. To stand strong. Stand strong. Now Paul describes for us what this spiritual engagement, what this enemy is, and what this battle means. To Pastor, if I'm to be praying, and if I'm to be standing, and I'm to be uh, being strengthened by the, the strength of the Lord, then should not be aware of what's going on? Absolutely. And that's really what the whole message is today is I want you just to be aware. Not because I want you to go find it. I don't want you to ask for it. I don't want you to search after it. But I want you to be aware. Now, I'm going to take a divine time out right here. Can I do that? That's what I call it, divine time out. You may be sitting there saying, Pastor, listen. This may make for some good theater. It may even make for a good movie. But is this stuff really real? Is this real? I want to tell you, my wife and I have people we know. It's real. They've been engaged. They've been influenced. For anonymity purposes, I, I, I want to tell you one story, quick story. I'm not going to give you his name. I'm going to tell you how I know him. We just know him. We know a young man. That not only was he engaged, he went looking for it and became a Luciferian. He became a Satanist. Satan was his master. He gave himself to that world. Since then, God took him halfway around the world to Nepal. And in the country of Nepal, God got a hold of him and saved that man's life. Amen. My wife and I were introduced to him through an acquaintance, and he began to share with me just some stories of what life was like as a follower of Satan. And that him and five other buddies, their job, their assignment from the enemy was to infiltrate churches like ours, masked around like their believers. That they love Jesus. And they would come in and they would befriend the pastor and they would befriend the pastor's kids and they would befriend the leadership and they would act like, hey, we want to be here, we want to help. And all the while they are scheming to find a way for that pastor to fall. And he said to me, he said, Pastor Gary, I'm ashamed to say that me and my five buddies caused three pastors in our city churches to fall because that was our son. And I'm here to tell you there's a real enemy. I'm here to tell you this isn't a playground. This is a battleground. And we need to know what we're engaged in. We need to know. So let me walk you through just five quick things this morning. We'll be done. We can go get our peanut butter and jelly <laughs> what is this spiritual engagement that I need to be aware of? Number one, you need to be aware of the enemy. You need to first have an awareness of the enemy. Look back at verse 12, or verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. Paul names him. He names him the devil. There's many names he goes by in the Bible. His name is Satan. His name is the devil. He's known as Lucifer. In Isaiah 14 and, and Ezekiel 25, uh, we see him being cast out of heaven. Lucifer, that angel of light, that, that angel of position. 
that angel of authority, tried to elevate himself above God. He says, I will be like the Most High. And God cast him out of heaven. And we find him next in Genesis chapter 3. He's there in the form of a serpent. And he is talking to, verbally communicating with Eve in the garden. And he begins, the Bible says, to scheme her, to, to deceive her, to, to act like God was holding out on them. He, he tried to convince her that God is lying to you. And, and, uh, and then we, we see him again in Luke chapter 4 at the temptation with Jesus. And we see him in Revelation chapter 12. The, the Bible calls him the, the wicked one, that old dragon, the serpent, the deceiver. The Bible calls him a liar, a deceiver, an accuser, a tempter, a, a persecutor. He's a false light. He's a slanderer. He is a father to the lost, and he's a father of lies. He takes the truth and he tries to convince you and tries to convince me that the truth is a lie. And then he takes lies and he tries to convince you and he tries to convince me that the lie is a truth. See, he's the father of lies. Right. He is a serpent. He's sneaky. And he's the enemy. And Paul says, I want you to be aware of the enemy. There's a real enemy out there. But not only is there a real enemy in the person of Satan, but number two, he says, I want you to be aware of the demonic empire. empire. The demonic empire. Look at verse number 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We'll come back to that. If we don't wrestle against that, then what do we wrestle against? But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You say, where, where are these Where are these things and these things that are going on? It's in the heavenlies. It's in the realm that we cannot see. It's in the, the spiritual world that we can't see with our physical eyes. And what Paul is describing in verse 12 is this uh, literal demonic world that has organization that has structure, that has plans, that has motives, and it has schemes. What you see listed in verse number 12 is the organizational structure of Satan's army. And we know Satan has an army because in Jude chapter 1 and verse 6, these, this army represents the fallen angels that followed Satan out of heaven. In Jude 1 and verse 6, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. In Revelation chapter 12, in verses 3 through 4, the Bible tells us that Satan took one-third of the angelic host of heaven with him to follow him. You say, how many is that? In? How many is that? I don't know. It's a bunch. The Bible doesn't tell us how many angels God ever created. He took a third of them with him. Meaning this. He had a pretty big army. And it's organized. And it's structured. And it has plans. And it has motives. And they are working. Listen, I'm going to back up just a moment just to let you know. Satan is not God. Right. He does not have God's ultimate power. He is not, listen, Satan and Jesus are not brothers, despite what false doctrines are out there. Right. And Satan is a created being by God. God created him and he chose to lift himself as equal with God. But he's not God. Meaning this, Satan cannot be everywhere at the same time. Right. He is a limited creature. He is limited. He does not have all power. He cannot just do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Yes, the Bible says he's the prince of the power of this air, but he does not have ultimate power. And by the way, he doesn't know everything. He is not all known. He doesn't know everything. Only God knows everything. Only God has all power. Only God can be everywhere at the same time. Satan is not equal to God. That's right. He is a limited, and not only limited being, but he is a defeated being. Okay. He has been defeated. But even though he's been defeated, he's still working. 
He's still scheming. He's still organizing. Because he hates you. And he hates me. And he hates God's creation. And he will do everything and anything he can. The Bible tells us in John. To steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what his cohorts, and that's what his organizational structure, and that's what the demonic empire, uh, empire is working to do. So we see we, we, we're, we're aware of the enemy. It's Satan. We're, we're aware of the demonic empire that he's using to carry out his plans. And then thirdly, we need to be aware of their methods. Their methods. Look, if you would, uh, at verse number 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. If you, if you use that King James Bible for a long time, the word was wiles of the devil. That, that word wiles is a, is a plural word. It's, it means more than one. And the idea of that word wiles was it was a specific crafted device. A specific crafted plan. Now think about that. A specific crafted plan. My grandmother, God bless her, she's in heaven. Remember you can say that after anything you want to. She made, one of my favorite things she made was called a dump cake. Have you ever heard of a dump cake? Mm -hmm. And all you did was you took the ingredients and you dumped them in the dish. And then you dumped the cake batter on top. And then you used about four cartons of butter. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so good, it'll, it'll make you want to slap your mom. <laughs> And what she would do is that she would take the, the, the dish and she would craft specifically the ingredients into that dish so that when you stuck it in the oven and it came out, what did I receive? A dump cake. <laughs> Golden brown with melted butter all over it. And it was specific. It was handmade. It was crafted just for me. Because that's what I loved. That's what I wanted. And I'm here to tell you that's the same idea of this word schemes here, this, this word wiles, is that the enemy knows you so well. See, he doesn't come, I mentioned this in our, in our Bible study time this morning at 930. He doesn't come around and, and hold up a sign that says, today, Brad Freeze, I'm coming after you. Just to let you know. He doesn't do that. He doesn't, go, he doesn't go to Ivan and say, hey, Ivan, I just want you to know this is what I'm going to do to you today. He doesn't work that way. No, he knows mankind so well. He knows you so well that his organization, his empire, schemes and plans specifically, specifically temptations. He crafts specifically things that he knows that you struggle with. He knows. See, there are things that I even may struggle with that I don't. So it's no use for the enemy to use those on me. And there's things I struggle with that Ivan doesn't. And there's no use to use it on him. So he specifically targets each of us with the schemes and plans that he knows that we can be tempted with. With the lust of our eyes and the lust of our flesh and the pride of life to lead us to make that choice to sin. Because his ultimate goal is to get you to go against God, to rebel against God, to disobey God, to not follow the Lord. And he's scheming and he's planning in that way. So can I illustrate that for you? Maybe some of you men struggle with sexual addiction. Pornography. Now, do you think that he's going to necessarily put pornography on a billboard while you're driving down the street? Not necessarily. But here's what he will do. 
He will leave you at home by yourself while your wife's away for a whole day. And you know that computer's in there. And what does one little what does one little look for? Oh, you know you need to check on the checking account anyway. You need to go over there and just just make sure the bills are paid. You need to you need to follow up on your wife, make sure to see what she's spending. You know she might probably have to spend your money again. You just need to check on that. And you go over there, you turn the computer. Yeah, I need to check on that. You turn the computer on, and, and before you know it, one, two, three clicks, boom, there it is. Do you not think he knows that? It's that easy. Do you not think he knows how to get you with that? Maybe ladies, maybe there's some ladies, you 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 just you just struggle, you just struggle with gossip. Man, you just want to get the news and give the news. You're like Barbara Walters. <laughs> and you're looking for it and you want to give it. And you hear something. I mean, you hear some juicy something. And the first thing that comes into your mind is, oh, I need to tell so-and-so. Oh, but I don't need to do that. Lord. But you know they're going to need to know that. They're going to, know, they're going to want to know that. You know, here's what you do. Just call them and tell them. I, I, some tell you, as long as you tell nobody else, it's okay. Shake your head. <laughs> If you promise not to tell somebody else, I'll tell you this, and then boom. Because he, know, he knows how to, how to get to you specifically. You've got to be aware of your methods. And in order for you to be aware of their methods, do you know what you have to be self-aware of? Of yourself. What am I easily tempted by? What, what is it that lures me away from following the Lord. What is it that lures me and tempts me to be disobedient? And I want you to know it's different for all of us. And he works and he schemes and he, and he manipulates and he, he, he's working this organized fashion to tempt you, to lead you, to lie to you. <coughs> You've got to be aware. You've got to be aware. In the past, we're aware of the enemy, we're aware of the, the demonic empire, we're aware of the methods. Number four, we have to be aware of who the enemy is not. I go back to the beginning of verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If the enemy is saved, then who is, the, who is not the enemy? Who is not the enemy? The idea of this, this word wrestle. It means, the idea is hand-to-hand is -hand combat. Up close, hand-to-hand -hand combat. That means face-to-face. Face-to-face. Who is it that is not my enemy? Who am I not wrestling with face-to-face? -face? You're not my enemy. As the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, you are not my enemy. My wife is not my enemy. You say, well, my wife and I, we have some intense times of fellowship. She's not the enemy. It may feel like it, and that's the lie of Satan, but she's not the enemy. Your kids are not your enemy. You say, Pastor, I just want to kill them. I understand. I've got three of them, but they're not the enemy. Your wife is not the enemy. Your kids are not the enemy. Our community is not the enemy. But you know what kind of community we're living in? They're not the enemy. We're not wrestling with politics. Politics is not the enemy. Our culture is not the enemy. The LGBTQ XYZ community is not the enemy. None of these people are the enemy. We are not wrestling against contemporary or traditional. We are not wrestling with music styles, dress styles, and worship styles. They are not the enemy. Satan is engaging us with a hierarchy of demonic powers and schemes that he is coming after us. And these things that I just mentioned, they are not the enemy. He's the enemy. And you've got to be aware. And you've got to call out, I'm not against my wife. I'm not against my kids. I'm not against the pastor. I'm not against the church. I'm not against the members. I'm not against this community. The enemy is the one trying to kill and destroy and steal from us. The joy of God and the peace of God and the power of God 
in my life. Call out the enemy for who he is. That's right. You've got to be aware of who he is. The Bible tells us the weapons in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not earthly, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, I want you to be aware, church, that in our praying, we are not on the playground, but we are in the battleground. And our enemy is in the heavenlies, and our weapons are been made available because we need to engage the warfare around us. And that brings me to the last point. Is that we've got to be aware of the God-supplied defense strategy. The God-supplied defense strategy. I'm not going into all this today, but in verses 13 through 18, Paul tells them it's time to suit up. You're engaged in this spiritual warfare. He is coming after you. And he, he's looking to deceive you and lie to you and discourage you and destroy you and, and uh, render you inoperable. So he says it's time to suit up. He, he describes it using armor because in that day they would understand what Roman armor was. And so he's using the analogy of putting on these list of things like you're putting on a suit of armor. And he tells them that if you're going to be engaged in this battle, if you're going to fight this battle against the enemy, then you need to put on truth. Why? Because he's a liar. You need to put on righteousness. Why? Because he is unrighteous. You need to put on peace. Why? Because he is the opposite, the disruptor of peace. You need to put on salvation. Why? Because he, he wants to uh, ruin your life and ruin your eternity. You need to put on faith and, and take up the sword of the Spirit. And then finally, verse 18, he says, after all this, pray at all times because prayer is the means by which you armor up. You put on the armor of God. Like what John Piper said in his book, Let the Nations Be Glad. When he says, talking about spiritual warfare and talking about prayer, he says, prayer is a wartime walkie-talkie, not a domestic intercom. One of the reasons our prayer life malfunctions is that we treat prayer like a domestic intercom calling for the butler to get us another pillow for our apartment. Rather than treating prayer like a wartime walkie-talkie for calling down the power of God, for calling down the means and the supply of God that we are engaged in this warfare. And church, I'm here to tell you today that if you are not participating in prayer in your life, then you are losing the battle. You're not losing the war. If you're a believer, you won the war. Christ won the war for us. And we know ultimately Satan's demise is hell and our ultimate destination is heaven. But today, right here, if you're not engaging in prayer, if you're not praying in the power of the Spirit, then you need to know you'll be losing some battle. say, Pastor, I don't know if I can remember all those pieces here listed every day and all the time. Then maybe you can remember this, Romans 13, verse 14, where Paul said, just put on Christ. Just put on Christ. As I was preparing for the message, I, I came across this by, by Tony Evans, and I thought it was an amazing way to describe Romans 13 and 14. He said, if... Uh, why we need to put on Christ. Paul said to put on truth. And when you put on Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Paul said to put on righteousness. The Bible says Jesus is my righteousness. Paul said to put on peace. Jesus in the world said you will have tribulation, but I will give you my peace. 
Paul said, put on salvation. The Bible says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our salvation. Finally, Paul said, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. When you forget all the pieces of the armor, then remember this. Just put on Jesus. Amen. And stand in the evil day. In the strength and in the power and in the might of Jesus. That's right. And pray. And pray. And pray. Thank you. When I pray, I am declaring that I need the help and the strength and the power and the protection that only Jesus can give to me in this battle. Sure, you've seen it before, but I came to my mind this week as I was preparing this sermon. Man, if we, if we could pray like this, if we could recognize that we are engaged in a warfare, <coughs> and we could get a hold of God, and we would seek after God, and we would pray like this woman prayed, it would not only change our lives, it would change others' lives, it would change our church. It would change our communities. It would change our world. Watch this three-minute clip, if you would. I may remember that woman in the movie Prayer Room. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of the movie, that lady drops on her knees in that in that, that little closet there she has. She begins to cry out to God. Amen. She says, God, you did it again. God, you did it again. And I'm here to tell you, church, the enemy is trying to destroy some marriages. The enemy is trying to destroy some kids. The enemy is trying to destroy churches. The enemy is trying to, to, to destroy what, what we as a church are trying to, to do in the community and, and trying to reach people. He's trying to destroy that. And I'm here to tell you, you know, if God's people would get on their knees, he can do it again. That's right. He can do it again. He can, he can intervene into your life, in your situation. And he can do and work if you'll stand. If you'll stand. In the bottom of your outline there, I gave you three things to think about. Who, who's your enemy? Who have you, who have you, who have you convinced is your enemy? It's not one another. It's not me. It's not it's not me, Gene. It's not the demons. It's, it's not your boss. It's the, those are just who the enemy is using in your life. That's not the enemy. Who's the enemy? Call them out. And then just begin to pray. You say, Pastor, I, I tried that prayer thing. I tried that prayer thing this weekend. I didn't make it past the second day. You know what? Try again. Stand again. 
He didn't come through this week. He, nothing changed this week. <clears throat> Daniel waited 21 days. 21 days. Start again this week. He will come through. Amen. He will come through. Let me ask you this morning. What is the battle you're engaged in right now? What is the enemy scheme in your life right now? What is he coming after? I, Chad. I'm going to pick on Chad. Y'all know Chad's head deacon. Chad, yesterday, Brad did too. Brad Freed sent me a message yesterday. Chad sent me a message. He goes, I know God's working. God's doing something. I said, why is that? He said, because the enemy's reared his head. Things are coming up. I knew, I knew without a doubt, about Thursday, when I was praying, what's going to happen? Well, how the enemy's gonna how's the enemy gonna do it now? How's he gonna try to see it now? And sure enough, it started. But you know what? I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving in. We're gonna stand. Amen. We're gonna stand. And we're gonna stand. And you know what we're gonna do after that? We're gonna stand. And stand some more. See, if you do not have a personal relationship with Christ, the Bible says, not pastor, the Bible says that you are in the family of the enemy. He actually says it this way, your father is the devil. Your spiritual father is the devil. Now, that may sound uncomfortable, that may sound ugly, but that's just the way Jesus described it. But Jesus came and he died on the cross, and we're going to celebrate Easter in a couple weeks and celebrate the resurrection. He came and he died. For you, and he lived a life that you couldn't live, and he died the death that you deserve as a payment to God for your sin. And, and Jesus took it on himself so that you could have forgiveness. And that he, through faith in Jesus Christ, he would remove you from the Father, from the family of the Father of the enemy, into the new family of Jesus. And now you're out of heaven. So, Pastor, I've never had that happen to me. I've, I've never moved from one spiritual family of the enemy into the spiritual family of God. That's where it starts today for you. That's what you need in your life today. And if you've never done that, we would love to journey with you and walk you through that. And, and, and be sure you understand exactly what the Bible says. Jesus did for you and what you must do to receive. So, Pastor, I've been a, a Christian now. I've been a follower of Jesus for years. Then let me ask you, who is the enemy you're engaged in? Are you engaged in people around you? Are you engaged in, in, your, in your marriage and in, in your kids and in, in your coworkers and maybe the deacons, maybe the pastor? Are you engaged in them or are you engaging the real enemy? And instead of complaining, are you praying? Instead of, instead of griping, are you praying? Instead of, instead of being discouraged about it? Are you praying? Are you, are you bringing it to praying at all times of life? Because the enemy's trying. He's scheming against you. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you an opportunity for you to just pray and talk with God. And ask God, God, help me to put on Christ to stand Help me to put on prayer this week and call out on your name every day this year and to take that stand against the Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for...
today was an awareness where we become aware that there's a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare, and you have provided us a way to stand in that warfare in your strength and your might, calling out, being aware of the real enemy, and being aware that you have given us the means to stand against those schemes and those wiles and, and those things that the, 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 the enemy has crafted against us. And Lord, this week I pray for your people, your church, that you would with the strength in Jesus Christ enable them to stand against them and declare your victory, your power. Lord, we're not looking for the fight. We're not trying to engage it. But Lord, we're going to stand against it and not give up any more ground in our lives. Lord, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Well, she's wet. I'm not. <laughs> Something else I found out, too. Pastor Jewers was a lot skinnier than I was. <laughs> and these things are tight. <laughs> and uh, I got them on, amen. I'm ready for fishing. Uh, hey, it's great to be able to baptize ML today. And uh, ML came a couple weeks ago and declared that she'd like to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And, uh, and if you're new to what baptism is, uh, baptism is a, a, a visual picture of what happened to her spiritually and uh, how she trusted Christ. And the Bible says that she died with him, her old man died with Christ, and was buried, and she was raised uh, newness to life uh, with a, the new creature in Christ. And so uh, that's what the water represents, is, is just a visual picture of what she decided to do, spirits of the Lord Jesus. And so, ML, do you believe Jesus died to save you? Yes. Have you asked the Lord to save you? Yes. And you believe the Lord has saved you? Yes. And now it's your choice to follow him and believe your baptism and live for him? Yes. Based upon your obedience in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the light of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. The Bible says it's been done as the Lord commanded, and yet there is still more room. Amen. Amen. And if you've never followed Christ in baptism... Uh, let me know, let one of the deacons know, let, let PG know. We'd love to talk to you about that and uh, help you with that next step uh, in your faith walk with Jesus. And uh, hey, staying with me today, I think Pastor Gary, did you pray? Yes. I can pray again. You know what? Pray again. Pray again. <laughs> Do it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I forgot about that. Thank you. I always have my right hand man tell me what to do. And uh, all in favor of receiving ML as a member of Calvary Baptist Church, uh, raise your right hand. I want to see everybody. Those of you who are against it, meet me out back <laughs> after we're done with church. Are there any opposed? I didn't think so. Hey, and uh, we're glad to receive ML into the family of Calvary Baptist Church. And uh, delighted to have you here today. Great crowd today. Thank you for coming. For those who came for ML's baptism, thank you for being here and encouraging and supporting her. And we look forward to seeing you next time. By the way, discipleship was amazing. We had over 60 folks come out between Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, if you didn't get a book, we still have those CBICI if you need one. And Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday night. God bless you.